हेलो एंड वेलकम टू करंट न्यूज आई एम अमृत उपाध्याय इन दिस स्पेशल सेगमेंट वी विल डिस्कस न्यूज व्हिच इज इंपॉर्टेंट फ्रॉम द पर्सपेक्टिव ऑफ योर एग्जाम द बुलेटिन ऑफ द लास्ट होल वीक व्हिच माइट एको इन योर क्वेश्चन पेपर इन द एग्जामिनेशन हॉल सो लेट्स बिगिन विद हेडलाइंस तमिलनाडु गवर्नमेंट एंड गवर्नर रिलेशनशिप कम्स अंडर स्ट्रेन ओवर द नीट बिल गवर्नर रिटर्न्स द बिल एबॉलिशिंग नीट एंट्रेंस एग्जाम असेंबली पासिस द बिल अगेन Debate on motion of thanks to the president's address in the parliament discussions on Pegasus spyware and government efforts in fighting covid president delivers address under article 87 of the constitution of india Official data on national climate change adaptation fund released in the parliament 30 projects ongoing under the fund adaptation fund has been introduced as a pilot project in india Asiatic wild dogs is spotted after 30 years in Kyrgyzstan's Pamir region population declining due to habitat loss Asiatic wild dogs are confined to south and southeast asia and the government to amend the no build zone near the ancient monuments presently construction banned within 100 meters of the monument The Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Sites and Remains Act 1958 provides protection to India's monuments. So let's begin with the news of the week. The Governor of Tamil Nadu has returned the bill abolishing the NEET entrance exam for graduation medical degree courses to the Tamil Nadu Legislative Assembly. Governor R N Ravi is of the view that the bill is against the interests of rural and economically poor students. Therefore, the Tamil Nadu Legislative Assembly should reconsider the bill. It should be noted that a demand was put forward for granting admission to the students in the graduation medical degree courses on the basis of 12th class marks instead of NEET entrance exam in the bill passed by the Tamil Nadu Legislative Assembly. Tamil Nadu Chief Minister M K Stalin has accused the governor on the matter of returning the bill. He stated that the governor has failed to perform his duties assigned by the Constitution of India. Actually, the bill passed by the Tamil Nadu Legislative Assembly was sent to the governor in September 2021. Since then, the Tamil Nadu government has been demanding the governor to send the bill for the President of India's assent. but the governor instead of sending the bill to the president returned it to the speaker of the tamil nadu legislative assembly for reconsideration latest update on the issue is that the assembly readopted the bill on 8th february article 200 of the constitution of india deals with the powers of the governor with respect to the bills passed by the state assembly under the article the governor has three options on the bill passed by the assembly Firstly to give his assent to the bill passed by the assembly or to reject the bill secondly to return the bill with or without a message to the assembly for reconsideration and thirdly to reserve the bill for the president's consideration article 201 of the constitution of india deals with a bill reserved for the president's consideration once a bill is reserved for the president's consideration then the governor plays no further role in the bill's enactment The president has full veto power regarding such bills. The president can refuse to give his assent to such a bill not only for the first time but also for the second time. Besides, the president can also exercise his pocket veto power on a bill passed by the state assembly. Amendments were proposed in the motion of thanks to the president's address recently. These amendments include the alleged use of Pegasus spyware by the government and the government's efforts in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic etc. There is a provision in Article 87 of the Constitution of India for the president's special address. As per the article, the president shall jointly address both the houses of parliament in the first session after each general election to the Lok Sabha and at the beginning of the first session of every year. For the president's address a joint session of both the houses of parliament must be summoned 
The President's address presents a review of the varied activities and achievements of the government during the last year. In addition, it also includes the details of the policies and programs of the government for the upcoming year. After the President's address, the motion of thanks is presented by the MPs of the ruling party in both the houses. Discussions on the motion of thanks conclude with the reply of the Prime Minister or any other minister. If during the discussions any amendment is placed before the House and if it is accepted, then the motion of thanks is adopted as amended. After the discussions conclude, the motion of thanks is put to vote. It should be noted that the motion of thanks must be passed in the House, otherwise it will be considered as the government's failure and the government will go into no confidence in the Lok Sabha. The Minister of State for Home Affairs has informed the Lok Sabha recently that the government has granted Indian citizenship to about 5,000 foreigners during the last five years. It is noteworthy that citizenship is a subject in the union list of the Constitution of India. Although the Constitution does not define the word citizen, Articles 5 to 11 of the Constitution detail the various categories of individuals eligible for Indian citizenship. Besides, Article 11 of the Constitution also confers powers on the Parliament for passing laws on the matters related to citizenship. By exercising these powers, the Citizenship Act 1955 was passed by the Parliament. It should be noted that the provisions related to acquiring Indian citizenship are mentioned in the Citizenship Act 1955. This Act provisions for granting the citizenship of India on five bases, namely birth, descent, registration, naturalization, and incorporation of territory. Indian citizenship is granted by registration under Section 5, by naturalization under Section 6, and by the incorporation of any territory into India under Section 7 of the Act. The Citizenship Act 1955 was amended in 2019. The amendment was introduced for expediting the process of granting citizenship to religious minorities from Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and Pakistan who came to India before 2015. Under the amendment, the condition of uh, residing in India for at least 11 years before applying for citizenship by naturalization has been reduced to 5 years. The center has issued new guidelines that is Central Media Accreditation Guidelines 2022 regarding accreditation of media platforms recently. As per the new guidelines, if a journalist acts with prejudice which can harm the security and sovereignty of India, then his accreditation can be cancelled or suspended. The government can also consider the country's unity, foreign relations, law and order of cognizable offences as grounds of cancelling or suspending a journalist's accreditation. The guidelines also mention grounds like etiquette, morality, contempt of court and abatement of offence for cancelling or suspending a journalist's accreditation. The guidelines will be applicable to the journalists working in different headquarters attached to the Government of India. It has been further mentioned in the guidelines that if digital news publishers apply for accreditation, then they will have to provide full information to Ministry of Information and Broadcasting. During this period, they will have to follow the Information Technology Code of Conduct Rules 2021. In the guidelines, some points are mentioned for news-related websites too. These websites should have continuously operated for at least one year. The editor of the news portal should be an Indian national. Besides, the website should have a registered office in India. As per the guidelines, no accreditation will be granted to freelance journalists working for foreign news media organizations. The guidelines also mention forming a Central Media Accreditation Committee. The Principal Director General of PIB will be the committee's chairman. The committee will have a maximum of 25 members who will be nominated by Government of India. Once the committee is constituted, its tenure will be two years from the committee's first meeting. The Indian Footwear and Leather Development Program has been approved for continuing beyond the year 2021-22 with a budget of 1700 crore rupees. It has now been decided to continue the program till 31st March 2026 or the next review meeting. 
The program is aimed at developing infrastructure for the leather industry sector, addressing the sector-specific environmental concerns and increasing additional investment, employment generation and production in the sector. It is noteworthy that the Indian Footwear and Leather Development Program was previously known as Indian Footwear Leather and Accessories Development Program. The program has been successful in imparting skills to over 3.24 lakh individuals during 2017 to 2020. The program has contributed in creating quality employment and skill development especially for women, making the leather industry more environment friendly and promoting sustainable production systems. Besides, it has also played a pivotal role in reducing poverty, promoting gender equality and imparting sector-specific skills and knowledge to the leather industry clusters present in different parts of the country. Mr. Ashwini Kumar Chaube, Minister of State for Environment, Forest and Climate Change informed in Rajya Sabha that so far 30 projects have been sanctioned in 27 states and UTs under the National Adaptation Fund for Climate Change. In India, the National Adaptation Fund for Climate Change has been launched as a pilot project. The projects undertaken under the National Adaptation Fund for Climate Change also include activities related to the coastal areas of the states of Kerala, Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh. Some of the activities are as follows. Promoting integrated farming system of coastal wetland capper of North Kerala. Managing and reviving coastal habitats and biodiversity for climate change adaptation and sustainable livelihoods in the Gulf of Mannar, Tamil Nadu and taking climate resilient actions for dairy sector in coastal and arid regions of Andhra Pradesh. It is noteworthy that the National Adaptation Fund for Climate Change was established in August 2015 for supporting adaptation activities in the states and UTs of India. It is aimed at supporting such states and UTs which are not capable of bearing the adaptation cost for addressing the adverse effects of climate change National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development, that is NABARD, is the national implementing agency of the fund. A team of scientists has come up with a local solution for removing the waste generated from different types of fuels and plastics around Antarctica. For this purpose, Argentinian scientists have resorted to microbes found around Antarctica. These microbes will make Antarctica pollution-free by eating diesel. It is noteworthy that the research stations of different countries located in Antarctica use diesel for electricity and heat and diesel is a major cause of pollution in Antarctica. As per the scientists, local bacteria and fungi will be used in these microbes. The removal of waste with the help of bacteria, fungi, yeast etc. is called bioremediation. In this technique, hazardous waste such as oils, solvents and pesticides are converted into non-toxic substances with the help of microbes. These microbes convert waste into water and gases like carbon dioxide as the waste serves as food for the microbes. Bioremediation can be used both in situ that is on-site and ex situ that is off-site. However, this method requires the right temperature, nutrition and combination of food items. Bioremediation has distinct advantages over the other methods of waste removal. In this technique, instead of merely passing the waste from one part of the environment to another, it is made non-poisonous or less toxic. This method is more eco-friendly than the excavation process and it also costs less. This method includes bio-venting, landforming, bioreactor, composting, phytoremediation, bio-augmentation, rhizofiltration and biostimulation. Microbes like Fusarius, Bacillus cerus, Aspergillus niger, Partina, Heloscarsia are being used in this method for removing oil. Dholes, that is Asiatic wild dogs, were spotted in Kyrgyzstan recently. As per a research team, dholes have been spotted in Central Asia's Pami region after about 30 years. In the survey, the research team has also spotted species like snow leopard and Eurasian lynx, which are members of the cat family. From the recent findings, it can be assumed that the Central Asian region is suitable for snow leopard and Eurasian lynx. Dholes are also known as wild dogs, Indian wild dogs and red dogs. 
Dole's body structure is like that of a fox, but they are larger in size. They can be identified by a large skull and front mouth as well as by the black furs on its tail's end. Dole's neck and chest are usually white or light in color. The major reason for the decline in the number of dholes is their complex social structure and heredity. As per the experts, dholes require more land than any other Asian mammals for survival. Dholes are now confined to South Asia and Southeast Asia due to the loss of their habitats. Dholes are found near the Pamir and Altai mountains as these regions are scantily populated. The IUCN has included dholes in the endangered category in its red list due to their declining number. Besides, dholes are also included in the second schedule of the Wildlife Protection Act. Dholes can live in dense forests, deciduous forests and pine forests. Therefore, dholes can be spotted in Central India, Western Ghats and Northeast India. Dholes can also be spotted in Bandhaugad, Pench, Mudumalai, Indravati and Debru Sekhoba National Parks. The central government is considering to change the limit of 100 meters of restricted area for construction related activities around centrally protected monuments. Actually, it has been revealed in a recent parliamentary standing committee report that the 2010 amendment to the Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Sites and Remains Act 1958 was done without seeking any input from the Archaeological Survey of India. Besides, there was no specific reason behind the limit of 100 meters of restricted area and 300 meters of regulated area beyond this zone fixed by the amendment. Therefore, it is being planned to replace the existing limit with site-specific limits to be decided by the expert committee. For replacing the existing limit with site-specific limits, the Ministry of Culture is working on amending the Act once again. By this proposed amendment, changes will be made in Section 20A of the Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Sites and Remains Act 1958. Section 20A of this Act provides for a restricted area around a monument. After the amendment to the Act, expert monuments committees will be able to decide the restricted area around a particular monument. In addition, the Archaeological Survey of India will also be able to hold the concerned authorities responsible for the construction of illegal buildings at protected sites. Besides, it will also help in taking action against encroachments on these important historical sites. It should be noted that the Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Sites and Remains Act 1958 provisions for the protection of historical monuments, archaeological sites and site remains of national importance. It is noteworthy that Taj Mahal, Ajanta Cave, Sanchi Stupa and Konark Sun Temple etc. have been designated as ancient monuments of national importance in India and these monuments are protected under the Act. In the recent budget session, Minister of State for Health and Family Welfare, Bharti Praveen Pawar replied to the questions related to anemia in the Lok Sabha. She informed that the government is taking steps for improving anemia status in all the identified clusters of all the states' UTs. In addition, the ministry is also providing financial and technical assistance to the states and UTs under the National Health Mission. Anemia Mukt Bharat Abhiyan was launched in 2018 for reducing anemia among women, children and adolescents. The campaign provides preventive and a remedial mechanism through 6 into 6 into 6 strategy. It includes 6 targeted beneficiary groups, 6 government interventions and 6 institutional mechanisms for all the stakeholders. The 6 target beneficiary groups are men, women, adolescent boys, adolescent girls, pregnant women and children. Anemia is a condition in which the number of red blood cells or its oxygen carrying capacity becomes insufficient to meet the requirements of the blood in the body. It leads to iron deficiency in the body. In addition, deficiency of vitamin B12 and vitamin A and genetic disorders can also cause anemia. Let us now look at the five questions based on the bulletin. Questions for this series are 
फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज रिजर्विंग अ बिल पास्ड बाय द लेजिस्लेटिव असेंबली बाय अ गवर्नर फॉर द प्रेजिडेंट एसेंट रेफर्स टू विच कंसेप्ट इंक्लीनेशन टू वर्ड्स फेडरलिज्म डिसेंट्रलाइजेशन ऑफ पावर इंक्लीनेशन टू वर्ड्स यूनिटरियानिज्म और वेलफेयर स्टेट नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज कंसिडर द फॉलोइंग स्टेटमेंट वन इन इंडिया नीदर द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन ऑफ इंडिया नॉर एनी लॉ प्रोवाइड्स द डेफिनेशन ऑफ न्यूज पेपर टू एट प्रेजेंट डिजिटल न्यूज पब्लिशर्स इन इंडिया आर नॉट रेगुलेटेड बाय एनी लॉ विच ऑफ द अब स्टेटमेंट और स्टेटमेंट इज और आर करेक्ट वन ओनली टू ओनली बोथ वन एंड टू और नीदर वन नॉट टू नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज If the motion of thanks on the president's address is not passed in the Lok Sabha then what will be its effect the president will have to resign from his office it will be inferred that the council of ministers is in office unconstitutionally or the motion of thanks will be introduced repeatedly in the house till it is passed or it will be inferred that the council of ministers has lost its confidence in the house and it will form the grounds for a no confidence motion against the council of ministers next question is consider the following statements with the reference to bio remediation of waste one bio remediation can only be in situ two bacteria fungi and yeast etc can be used for the disposal of oil waste three phytoremediation is a process of bio remediation Which of the above statements are correct? One and two only, two and three only, one and three only, or all of the above? Last question is prominently in news. The six into six into six strategy is related to anemia eradication in India, waste disposal in coastal areas, prevention of COVID nineteen infection in tribal communities, or educational expansion in island areas. So for the time being that's all in this bulletin do not forget to like share and subscribe drishti is hindi english and pcs youtube channel at then let us have a look at few more events of the last week in other news The Haryana government has released the draft prevention of unlawful conversions bill 2022 recently. This law prohibits conversion by false promises, coercion, fraud, greed or marriage. The bill provides for strict punishment in the conversion matters of minors, women scheduled caste and scheduled tribes. In addition, it declares marriages done by hiding religion as illegal. The Supreme Court in one of its recent decisions held that in present scenario conflict is being observed in marital relations due to the misuse of section 498A of IPC. The court is of the view that the tendency of using the section as an instrument of vengeance against the husband and his relatives is on rise. Section 498A was passed by the parliament in 1983. The section was aimed at preventing cruelty to a woman by her husband and in-laws. The section is a criminal law as per the section if a woman's husband or his relatives have committed atrocities on the woman then it is a punishable offence with imprisonment of up to 3 years and the accused to be fined as well. Railway Protection Force that is RPF has started operation Ahat to prevent human trafficking. It will be mainly implemented in trains that operate from border countries like Myanmar, Nepal and Bangladesh. Under the operation RPF will deploy special forces in the long distance trains. The special force will mainly work for protecting and providing security to women and children from human traffickers. The operation is being conducted by the Ministry of Railways and Railway Protection Force works under the Ministry of Railways. Kerala government has recently announced to establish India's first graphene innovation center in Thrissur, Kerala. It is a joint venture of Kerala Digital University, Center for Electronics Technology Materials and Tata Steel Limited. The innovation center is a cross-functional scheme that provides a secure platform to innovative ideas. The state government will provide infrastructure for the project and the central government will support in attracting investors for manufacturing graphene products. Graphene is a flexible transparent and incredibly strong as well as the thinnest most electrically and thermally conductive material in the world some places in arunachal pradesh and meghalaya have been identified recently for saffron cultivation under the saffron bowl project the project has been initiated by nectar 
that is Northeast Center for Technology Application and Reach. The project has been initiated by Nectar for exploring the feasibility of growing saffron in the northeast region of India. Saffron is a plant whose dried stigma is used to prepare saffron spices. It is cultivated in special type of kareva soil. It is used in cosmetics for flavoring dishes and for preparing medicines. Due to the ongoing dispute between Russia and Ukraine, many political experts are speculating that as a last report, the United States may remove Russia from the international banking system, that is SWIFT. If America does so, then Russian banks may face a lot of challenges in carrying out international financial transactions. The full name of SWIFT is Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication. It is an international network of banks across the world that facilitates smooth transactions of funds globally. It was established in 1973 and its headquarters is in Belgium. The Oscar Awards nominations 2022 in 23 categories have been announced recently. The nominations for this year include Writing with Fire, a documentary by Delhi-based filmmakers Rintu Thomas and Sushmit Ghosh. It has made to the final list of five documentaries which will compete in the Best Documentary Feature category. The documentary sheds light on the inspiring story of Khabar Leheria, a newspaper run by Dalit women in the Bundelkhand region and its print to digital transition. The 94th Annual Oscar Awards will be held on 27th March 2022.